Yo from the Kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to Old Culture, where the road to salvation is paved with yellow bricks. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for being here. I'm not going to lie to you, good people. The conversation you're about to hear is one of the most enlightening and one of the most personal that you will ever hear on this show. And I have to thank our guest, Niles Heckman, for that. He brought a really cool idea to me for the chat, and I had no idea what to expect before we hit the record button, but what transpired, I think, is pretty inspiring. Niles is a multimedia savant. He's a writer, photographer, podcaster, and the man behind the films Shamans of the Global Village and the forthcoming Transmutation. He's also a frequent guest on my friend Ed Liu's Psychedelic Milk podcast. And what Niles and I did here was we talked a lot about our own personal growth and maturation, how it applies to our creations and our art, and then looked at how a man named Lyman Frank Baum followed a similar path to create maybe the most recognizable fairy tale in the history of art, The Wizard of Oz. Now that Wizard of Oz part of this, though, is actually the second hour of the chat, and if you're not supporting the show on Patreon, you're only getting the first half of this. So if you want to hear this in its entirety, head over to patreon.com slash oldculture to support the show for as little as two bucks a month. That'll get you access to extensions like this one as I continue to enhance and expand the Patreon content. And this is the first time I've really tried the whole first hour free, second hour for patrons thing. It's worth it though because what we talk about in the first hour is really a blueprint for Baum's creation of the Wizard of Oz and all the esoteric and occult symbolism found within it. And there's quite a bit of it actually. I'll tell you a bit more about that after the chat, but for now, enough prologue, let's flip the script to dialogue, open our subtle ears, and let some of these sweet beats stimulate our heart chakra. Maybe even that root chakra as well, if you smell what I'm cooking. Enjoy. All right, so Niles Heckman, you're in the house. Thanks for being here. I am in the house. Good to talk to you, buddy. Absolutely, man. Good to talk to you as well. I feel like I've talked to you before, but it's really just been vicariously through about 20 other podcasts that I've heard you on the past couple of years and enjoyed every single one of them. And, you know, I don't want to repeat a lot of those things for people who have heard you, but we do have to tell your origin story first. You know, I'm a comic book guy, so... I like hearing that how you got to right now to this point in your life story. So I guess, you know, start at the beginning and tell us where you are now in terms of occult philosophy or spirituality or whatever you think is appropriate. Yeah, sure. I'll give you the kind of, I guess, a little bit of a Cliff Notes version of the more modern version, because I have told my kind of origin story in long form and several other places that we could always like, like send people towards. But basically, I I essentially, the gist of me is I, I live live life as a man in the realm of earth. And I document life as a documentary photographer and filmmaker. And then I guess you could say I somewhat philosophize and consult on life on shows like this one on my own podcast in a series of essays I do on occasional speaking events. And then what I really love the most is almost engaging with others one-on-one directly in kind of a private dynamic. I guess you could say I'm all about life and living it as truthfully as one can, which the more developed one gets is actually Uh, the more spiritually, since we are spiritual beings of divine excellence currently living at some stage of a gradient inside a materialistic 3D world that we must self-initiate through to find happiness from within. So that's, you know, much of my life experiences, I guess you could say, come through my various projects that I create. The primary two being I'm the director of a pilot episode of a documentary series about indigenous entheogenic medicines and the modern shamanic resurgence, which is called Shamans of the Global Village. And that's the pilot episode of a series that we're trying to make independently. And also uh, the, a feature documentary called Transmutation, which I'm actually just completing as we're recording this podcast now. And that's about essentially the beauty and danger of a hidden spiritual path and shows folks that have essentially transformed themselves through the better by walking it. And then I also do a bit of um, essays, these kind of video essays of late, which are kind of smaller brushstroke projects, which I kind of toying my re- Reality Tunnel Essays, which are essentially me using my filmmaking skill set to share content about life to help me learn and help others with that have essentially ears to hear, right? So that makes things, it's nice to do like kind of large brushstroke projects and smaller brushstroke projects that have faster turnarounds that don't take years to complete. (laughs) So I I essentially, you know, create content which reflects who I am as well as themes that I'm interested in and subjects that I am inherently really feel the call towards talking about as somebody that essentially used to work in Hollywood, the opposite of what I was doing. So I guess you could say I'm becoming a bit of a esoteric filmmaker, which maybe maybe one day I could say I'm in the same vein as perhaps like a Warner Herzog or David Lynch, that Mm -hmm. his work is a bit a bit niche. But um, that's the type of dynamic I really enjoy the most. 
Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that Hollywood background because that is a uh, it's a fascinating dichotomy between what you do now. What's the major difference between that environment and that lifestyle and that way of creating versus the way that you create now? Yeah, well, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood is as much of a swamp as Washington or Wall Street, of course, especially with, you know, inter- interesting revelations coming out now about just the skullduggery of many layers of it. But, you know, this doesn't mean that there's not really good people trying to operate within those systems. And so I met a lot of cool people working in Hollywood. And I did a variety of different roles in post-production. You know, the main thing, the main gist of it, the summary is that I ultimately, you know, was a technician. I wasn't a creative, right? So I was essentially a cog in the gears of the assembly lines of big budget projects in Hollywood. So when you're working on, you know, let's use the biggest budget project in the universe that I worked on. Like when I was working on Avatar, you know, I was just a cog in an assembly line, right? And so you're working on this amazing, cool project. It's the same thing that is if you work on Pixar or something, you know, you're working at an, on amazing projects, but you're just one in a one in a thousand in an assembly line. So you're not as inherently actually, believe it or not, doing much creative. So I got to the point where I would much rather do my own creative thing on a zero budget project than do little to no creativity on a $300 million movie. So that was kind of the dynamic. So it's funny, yeah, because like Michael Phillip from Third Eye Drops kind of asked me the same question. He's like, no, it seems like you've gone backwards. But if you think about it, you haven't because it's like it's all about your own creative internal journey. And of course, Mm -hmm. there is the dynamic of how you make money doing these things. So this is the part of the balance that we find in these things. But it got to the the point where I would much rather do excellent creative things of, of conscious substance on projects that are still high production value because that's my background, but have limited resources. But then you can do these excellent creative things and not being part of Hollywood anymore. I'm all about telling stories that are very much outside the dynamic of Hollywood, of course, because that's what I was going to definitely get into today is that much of the content that we look at is very, very not good when you look at the mainstream of things. So I mean, here, I'll just give the summary of it. I mean, this is a good way to tie into what your show is all about, about Ryan, is that this podcast is essentially, you know, called a culture, which is something very important in the branding of your podcast, which highlights a word that means essentially a cult or hitting, hidden. And the meaning of a cult is essentially mystical, right? So the scientists seek to peel back the veil of human understanding and let's say witness reality and to unlock the mysteries of what lie behind the physical edifice of reality and to find balance in these things. And a magician employs symbols or ritual. And, you know, these revelations are as symbolic and cryptic as the methods they're used to reveal. So I think of something that I at some point hadn't watched in the past and I liked, but I didn't know why, like, let's say a movie like The Ninth Gate with Johnny Depp that has a lot of occult and esoteric imagery in it. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I didn't I wasn't developed enough to understand why I liked that movie. But now, as you get further along, and you find the language to describe these things, or you've done some of these practices, or you understand subconsciously more about what's going on behind the scenes. Now I can see why I always like that movie so much and why I'm called to that movie is because these are things that have always subconsciously felt true to me. So this this is kind of a, a good input for like this whole conversation, because I think we could kind of coin this talk like finding your your hidden self or your occult self, because we look around at the world and it gets like why you've you know done an excellent job of, of summarizing a good branding of this podcast. And we say, what is hidden and what is actually not hidden? And why is that? Right. So you can look at you can look at what's essentially well, you can look at that as essentially like an iceberg. Right. So what's above water is about maybe 10 percent max of the whole 90 percent structure or what, you know, 90 percent of it is under the water and 10 percent of it is above the water, which, you know, exoterically is such a beautiful metaphor for society today and how things are are are. So as I look at most mainstream comment or content, especially content that I used to work in, I have to say that much of it is essentially, you know, gone to poo. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's all it's yeah. all essentially vomit, you know, Kool-Aid and feces and, you know, much of like the swamps that I just talked about. And so we look at essentially that's maybe a little bit harsh of a way to say it. But in all, rea- in all reality, what is essentially not hidden is pretty much sugar and plastic. And what is hidden are like the yummy vegetables. Right. So most of most, if not all of the good stuff is below the surface unseen. And it's like essentially hidden in, in places where it's like a locked chest in a secret room in a you know rarely visited basement. So the whole dynamic with that, that I've come to realize through my own development is that it's almost intentionally structured that way so that you have to essentially find it yourself, right? So we, we look at some metaphor like I did when I was a young Sprout work on the Matrix sequels. But of course, at the time, I didn't understand the much of the Gnostic undertones of what was being said in the mm-hmm. original Matrix film or the mm-hmm. sequels. But now, as I very much do, you know, we can look at like the blue pill as essentially like, you know, pr- perceived security or falsehood or peaceful ignorance of illusion, right, in the Plato's cave sense. And we can look at the red pill as essentially knowledge and freedom and brutal truth of what is reality. 
right? So the, so the blue pill is like, essentially, you can think of it as like willfully seek, seeking ignorance, or the red pill is willfully seeking knowledge. And so I hadn't maybe at the time when I had in an earlier form of career fully taken the, the red pill. But I feel like at times, you know, it's not like it's all or nothing. These are shades of, these are gradients. They're, they're various shades of gray. But as I've taken a little bit more of the red pill, I've come to understand these things. So you can, you can see how most people go the vast majority of their whole lives without ever eating any real yummy mental vegetables. So we, we can ask ourselves something like, why does everyone at an amusement park love Harry Potter, but they know little to nothing about the occult roots of what Harry Potter is about, right? So um, yeah, and, and in terms of, I mean, for me, in terms of the dynamic, I think we could focus this conversation on the dynamic of input output from the as within, so without sense. Mm-hmm. So as we as we talk about this, is like why why is so much why is so much not hidden, or why is so much hidden? I should say, and, and the the tiny little amount that is not hidden is kind of this iceberg that's above the surface, this tiny little sliver of of sugar and plastic that we are perceived as the kind of mainstream reality tunnel of what is going on. So as much as much of anything, you can you can look at this from a spiritual question as any, and it's really about about a self initiation of taking it upon yourself to search off the beaten path content. And I always look at this as basically the way that I've been taught about this from some of my teachers that are of excellence is that there's essentially four stages of internal transformation. And this is really kind of four stages of spiritual growth. So the first one is observation. And the next one is reformation. And the third one is selfhood. And then there's actually a fourth stage beyond that, which is which is seership, which is essentially seeing the true nature of reality, which is not exoteric five sense material reality, but is that's that's a whole nother story. But we can kind of focus on the first three for, through this conversation. So in terms of as within, so without, or like just developing self so that you can then create things of excellence, you know, you can't just be seeking or sharing information. You got to be sharing knowledge that is basically developed within the self through time. So as we look at observation, which is basically just consumption, right? Like people, when they, when they go home, come home from their job and they choose to consume something from the day, what are they consuming? Are they opening a book by Manly Palmer Hall or are they like just sitting there and watching Netflix or watching the latest like, you know, crap daytime TV or reality television show? So it's this dynamic of like, what are you going to input for yourself so that you can then create things of excellence in whatever art form you are, whether or not you're like the band tool that had developed themselves so much to then get to these kind of, you know, dark psychedelia imagery and they're embedded within their music and their and their branding of their albums. Or is it more about it's basically like, are you going to be a normie that's garbage in, garbage out? Or are you going to actually take the time to, to develop and observe things of excellence to get there? Right. So the inter- Internet's been like a wonderful tool for this. And with the rise of all, you know alternative media like podcasts such as this, audiobooks, etc., there's a lot more information that we're exposed to in the last 20 years than what we usually would have been able to access. That usually would have only come about through like getting access to private libraries or something like that. You know, like how in the Ninth Gate, you remember that film, The Ninth Gate, where all the good like occult books were in these like kind of aristocratic libraries, right? Yeah. So you had to know somebody to get to their library to read one of these yummy books. Although a lot of stuff is still not on the internet, there you have certain a ton of access to to good information now if you so choose to access it so the most 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 people seem to be you know watching netflix all day which is fine you know we all watch the netflix here and there but like it's not like they're taking all their time to search out really excellent like knowledgeable sources so if you are searching around for things to input you know that be any form of entertainment or information like 90 i'd say 90 percent or plus of it is not so good right it's not enriching or fulfilling and you can't find it from turning on the television or reading an old, or reading a newspaper or, or hearing most music or watching most movies. It comes from essentially hidden sources, right? So you must leave these kind of high traffic highways and go out into the well, the metaphor I use is like you have to leave the high traffic highways and go off into the mountain forests where less people are there and you have to actually find good things. So this is the kind of quest of the artist, right? Or the creative is like, what are you going to consume so that then you can create things of excellence, whatever your medium may be, whether or not you're a writer or a musician or a filmmaker. Uh, from my standpoint, obviously, being a filmmaker, I use the reference of a lot of filmmaking and any sort of media making where if I look around at the internet and most of the content out there, like we said, has gone to poo. It's just absolute crap. So most f- short films that I see are not very good. Most film festival content and let's say this kind of like Vimeo staff pick dynamic or like, uh, you know, various certain things that are put to the forefront. It's OK. You know, it might be technically very amazing and narratively it's somewhat thin. But ultimately, we can say that most of the content is like Hollywood content, which is essentially this kind of lightweight, you know, lowbrow and most of it is kind of the space chakra stuff. And when you occasionally see something that's embedded that's not that, that's excellent, right? Like we look at a movie like Doctor Strange, which had 
stuff in it that was trying to get towards more esoteric and occult themes. But, it, it, you know, it only went so far. There's only so far that you can go on the screen. But it's nice when you do see things that are trying. And there seems like a, a larger amount of projects these days that are showing more themes that resonate with folks like us or people that would be listening to this podcast so as somebody who has been in hollywood yeah. you know on the the back lots there as somebody who has seen that part of the machine is this an intentional dumbing down of people through pop culture or is this just a lack of self-awareness and self-knowledge and self-love that is reflected in our art it's it's two things. It's basically there's it's it's a lowest common denominator where only projects get made that are these kind of rehash reboot projects. You know, I used to work with a, a music video director that was quite crap and he wouldn't actually go to original sources to find things like he wouldn't go look at beautiful Renaissance artwork to get visual inspiration. He'd just look at the other kind of Vivo plastic music video that had just been made. So he was essentially just copying things, right? And so I think when projects get made, they just want to, you know, recycle the same material. They're so unwilling to look at things that are, are really paradigm destroying. And as I try and make documentary content that's paradigm destroying, I get a lot of rejections and no's from the system, <laughs> like we all do. I mean, you know, Alexander Graham Bell like did what he tried to make. He had 10,000 tries or something before he had a success making the light bulb. So it's like learn to love rejection within the confines of the standard structures of entertainment industry, especially with a lot of the behind the scenes and areas that's going on. But I think that's the kind of that's the, the, the like room temperature version. The more like yummy, juicy secret sauce is that. There is an intentional dumbing down. There's a thing called the fog index. I don't know if you've ever heard this. And it's basically, it's called the gunning fog index. And it's like, if, if you write, as you as a writer, Ryan, apparently when people write articles and stuff, there's a lot of things within the structures of, not necessarily screenplays written in Hollywood, but like within the structures of, let's say, journalism and newspaper writing, where if you use too big of words and use too, too much elaborate language, they'll take your article and they'll put it through this thing called the gunning fog index. And it literally tells you how to replace words with easier to understand words. So as you as we hear these terms like, oh, the United States reads at a seventh grade level. Well, that's actually really that's not that's intentionally done because we dumb down our content. Right. And so that's an example of some nefarious behind the scene strange going on that is intentionally dumbing things down so that we don't get the most juicy stuff you know and and that's the thing is like you look around at most people right where i think most people are nice people but they're quite they're so boring it's like they're empty vessels they're essentially like bots in this simulation i sometimes use this metaphor of you know people that we can't talk to about any of this material they're like when you're in a video game and you're just playing you know when you're in a mass multiplayer game and you might be playing against other real human beings but there's also other bots in the simulation you know so like as with most people it's like the consciousness is so low and the output is so dim that they're at maybe one of 10. So that when you're at one of 10 in terms of how developed you are, in terms of these stages, which as we talk about this observation stage, you know, they're very susceptible to outside influence. So all this kind of, you know, plastic and sugar of shopping malls and movie theaters, they let all that stuff penetrate them and all this like garbage that they get from the mainstream re unreality tunnel of illusion just really permeates, right? So as I, I think as we develop ourselves internally and we turn off bad material and we go to find only yummy material like you might find in those old occult libraries, that's really those yummy vegetables, then you become much more of a powerful being to do that, right? So I used to, when I was younger, I used to also just watch movies, right? So everything was like a reference to a movie. And in terms of the mind control of Hollywood, it's like I was just being handed information from what these, you know, what Hollywood was giving me before I had to, it's almost like if I wanted to become a filmmaker, I had to turn off a lot of Hollywood. It does seem like it's intentional on the, the creator's side, you know, like you mentioned the guy who was directing the music video and he was just like, ah, fuck it, I'm just going to copy what else has been done that's gotten a lot of views perhaps, but I'm curious then, so it's, it's not a systemic intentionality to, to do this, it's more just like there are individual artists, directors, you know, producers, whoever, that just are lazy, that lack originality? Is that kind of what we're getting at? Well, it is systematic. I think that it is, there's a lot of gatekeepers at play, you know, and, and as somebody that is a very much of, not so much in the system anymore, and as somebody that doesn't necessarily like gatekeepers, like let's say somebody that is a critic or um, like I mentioned, uh, a film festival or something that is going to determine what they say is good content or not, right? It's not, it's not subjective. It's not your own point of view. It's like what we deem worthy of content. It's like getting through all those gatekeepers is very difficult. And as there's more democratized forms of media, we're like, you know, we can put all of our content is going essentially to the same place, right? Like if I make something for $500, it's going to the same place as Netflix's latest $100 million movie. Right. It's just all about getting eyeballs on your content now. So in terms of that, 
it's more about just by- bypassing gatekeepers and most of the gatekeepers will shoot down stuff that is of let's say higher spiritual excellence and a lot of it because a lot of it is too kind of scary and paradigm destroying and goes against the convent goes against the conventions of what is Hollywood and the dogmas within Hollywood, just as much as the dogmas within Washington or Wall Street, you know, and, and it is true that, you know, a lot of Hollywood is run by people that have very specific political views or very specific religious orientations, stuff like mm-hmm. that. So it's, it's very much that dynamic, I'd say. That makes a lot of sense then. Yeah. You know, and I don't think it's all nefarious. I think it's always a mixture of the two. And it's always nice to highlight that within systems, you know, there's a lot of good people always working within systems. So I do right. say that it's more of a broader cultural thing. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, I don't want to go down the conspiracy uh, rabbit hole here, but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Let's recap that first phase of observation real quick, and then let's move on to the second phase of reformation. Yeah, well, let's just say this. This is funny, and I'll say something. And and in terms of observation, like most people never get past that in their entire life, right? Like they'll go through life after life as essentially, like Gurdjieff says, machines they are born, machines they are die, and they just live these robotic lives of machinery, repeat wash and repeat. And they don't really ever take the time to really observe what is going on, right? So we can look at each one of these stages has an exoteric, an outer, and an esoteric inner dynamic. So most people never really observe what is the true nature of what's going on around us in the society and, and what is really happening behind the scenes. And so I can give a reference to this, dude, where like, let's say that you or I, or both of us may or may not have had people on our podcast, for example, that are essentially coming on and just essentially sharing them knowledge, right? Like they're just sharing information. They just come on and they say things and they're just like, oh, you know, I've learned this and I've learned that. I learned that. But then it's all about application, right? It's more about your deeds and conduct and what you do. Mm -hmm. And it's good that you're observing what's going on. But in order to get to this next stage reformation, you actually need to start doing the work on yourself and you need to really understand that. So as somebody that basically I can, I can identify sometimes when I hear people that are just sharing the information, but then they haven't actually started to reform self a bit, right? So they're just, what they need to do is instead of like watching their 25th YouTube video on, you know, weird things related to something obscure within the spatial model of the universe, they need to actually structurally change things within their life, right? So they need to change their diet, they need to get a girlfriend, they need to adjust their social protocols, and they need to go live in a foreign country for a year. You know, they need to do these things outside of they need to start reforming them, themselves after they really start observing what is going on. So that's kind of these are kind of the natural stages, right? I see. And this is as we can speak to this and we can later speak to somebody else that I know has done this to create a kind of quintessential American fairy tale. It's a it's an interesting way to look at it. You know, in, in terms of like when you reform when you reform what is inside, it affects what happens outside. Right. So, again, in terms of like what you think and what you feel and how you act, you have to inwardly change to outwardly change the, the, the life that you live in terms of like truth, balance, harmony. And that's kind of more of the waking up dynamic and how most people don't you know, most people don't like what they're doing. Right. It's like three quarters of people don't like their day jobs, for example. So they're not ever going to take the time to really reform their life, even though they observe maybe some element of it that they don't like. So that's that's this is kind of where the autodidact comes in, right? Like the self-taught person. So when you are taking upon yourself to learn information that's more secret information, you're not going to get that from a formal structure somewhere. You know, you have to do that in terms of like an ch- internal changing process from within yourself. So you have to essentially completely change internally what's going on within you. And then you likely have to then change things in your outside life to really kind of burn down those structures to change that foundation of where you had been and what you had been doing. And we all know this, right? It's like we all know that, you know, we may start in one job and we don't like that job and we change careers because we don't like it, right? Or we want to... Mm-hmm. Go, go through these kind of transformations where we have then seen ourselves how we used to be. And we're like, oh, my gosh, that was so long ago. I can't believe I did that X, Y, Z. That's kind of the real reformation process, like both outside and in. And then that's how we kind of more arrive as to like, what is our real self? So, you know, I'm 38, dude, and I feel like I'm just starting to even discover who I really am. Right, <laughs> you know, yeah. like we like we're so expected to to feel like we know what we're supposed to do for our day jobs and you know, how we make fake money in commerce and these types of things. It's like by the time we graduate from high school, this is all expected of us. But a lot of us go to these, get a, get a XYZ career, you know, air quote career. And then it's like you realize you don't even want to be doing any of those things. So as somebody that, of course, melted down my old career, people could look at that as like, oh, my God, he, he totally, I don't want to say melted down, but it's essentially not doing that anymore. And, you know, what seemed like a pretty good thing. I know somebody that was also a dentist and they had a really good dental practice going, making a lot of money. And they were so developed and they they're so spiritually excellent 
that they basically could not bring it to themselves to go to that dental job anymore. They got to the point where it's just like, I can't do this anymore. It's a gravy train job. Societally and structurally, everything that tells me this is a great thing and I should strive for the excellence of being a dentist and what an amazing thing this thing of my resume has given me. But internally, he was reforming himself so much that he's like, I just can't be a dentist anymore. So he quit his practice. And now he's like, you know, working at a, at a spiritual retreat or something like that. You know, you go through these cycles and these stages. And each one of these, I'd say, is a good 10 years. But in terms of that, it's like okay. until you get to, let's say, stage three of self, you can't really create anything excellent. It's like, how are you going to create good stuff? How are you going to create this like beyond base chakra stuff until you really reform yourself, until you really transmute self internally? So and this, this, I think when we get to kind of selfhood, and again, as I'm approaching the age of 40, I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface of it. We start to discover essentially who we really are, right? And so then by that point, we're able to maybe analyze and decipher some of the embedded occulted details within that you see within other people's material, right? So you look back at some of this old alchemical and esoteric imagery, and you see that there's things in it that really call to you, and you're not sure why. And you, you know, in order to find that the creator of the content, you know, must create work that has, they, they have to do that internal work so they can kind of transform esoterically to better self exoterically. So this is where we can kind of talk about how you hear the dynamics of, let's say somebody like Philip K. Dick was actually then getting connections to self, which wasn't even his own personal self. It was him discovering who he really was, but then he was almost getting transmissions from what you might say is a higher self or a divine self. So, which you could argue is essentially the source of all things or, or, you know, our, a higher place, right? As you kind of, the universe can kind of see you as you go through this process. So this is, I think, as I've kind of come to develop it or understand it is communicated to us via symbolism and synchronicity in the day and then our dreams at night, right? So as we get information and we feel that there's something in something, it's like we should we should follow that path, right? We should feel the heart. The heart tells us something and we should follow those things. So if somebody is like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in doing this anymore. My heart tells me I should get out of this. Eventually, at some point, you will phase out of that if you continue engaging the will to do that. So we talk about like, you know, higher capacities and then the, the power of the mind and all of our, our larger capabilities. I think the real juju comes from when you can essentially find occult information and then share it in a, a non-occult ways to reach more people. And the only way that you can really do that is if you internally do this process or go through this to some extent. And, you know, it's all about it's nice if you can get like ears and eyeballs on content on your stuff and everybody wants to, you know, read or watch the new Harry Potter novel, like I said, but doesn't want to really learn the underlying real ceremonial magic that is part of Harry Potter. The only reason that you, the only way that you can really write that is if you had some of those experiences, right? If, if, if you've done these things directly. Mm -hmm. And so allegorical stories like essentially transmit spiritual truths that has have existed through all of man's what since the beginning of time i would say so that's when we when we get these seminal pieces of writing or, or nostalgia or like any sort of piece of media or famous piece of literature that has done this that is kind of you know the kind of transcended these things it's because somebody has at least consciously or unconsciously done these things and has gotten this information maybe that from higher self or and then has kind of recognized it and seen it so right, that's right. kind of so, what the oh. occult or i think conscious creator strives for well, that's okay. So, so I'm going to get real personal just for a moment. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast. I know I've talked about it with a couple of people privately, but this is essentially, this is why I started this project was to document my own process here, my own personal and spiritual development and growth. Like I am, I'm not to level three on your scale here. I, I don't even know if I'm at level two, but <laughs> I am. I decided that I at least know that I'm at, at level one, but I wanted to document this entire journey of mine and share it with people because I know that there are people out there going through the same thing. I mean, it's the kind of people that listen to your podcast or my podcast are people that they they crave this sort of intimate personal knowledge or, or depth or whatever. But I know there are people out there that, that listen to my show that are struggling with that balance between... You know, like we were talking about the career and that more material existence and then not being fulfilled or satisfied by that, but not knowing how to break free of it. You know what I mean? So I'm curious as somebody who has, I guess, done that, you know, you went from the, the Hollywood thing to now your own thing. You know, what sort of advice do you have to people out there who are struggling with their day to day lives on some level and 
don't feel satisfied and don't feel fulfilled, but maybe don't know how to get out of that and become fulfilled. Yeah, I mean, don't let the society or outside sources tell you what is a projection of success, right? So a lot of people end up in a psychiatrist's office because the culture and the society has told them that they need to have accomplished all these things, right? Like outside sources tell you what you need to do to make yourself happy or make yourself successful. You need the white picket fence suburban America version of happiness. And although, you know, my life personally is very much a mixture of a standard suburban life with much more of a kind of secret behind the scenes, you know, yummy, excellent spiritual life, you know, we balance these things. So it is all about the balance of them. And so it's not like you completely jettison one thing. And it's not like it happens overnight either, right? So it took me a long time. I mean, it was probably a good five to 10 years of phasing from one thing into another thing. And also you have to definitely be willing to accept a simplicity and a more humble lifestyle. So it's not like you're going to be able to have material excess when you follow more of a creative path. But that what this is what I would argue is one of the reasons why we're here, dude. So what you're you doing this on your podcast, this is why you're here. This is the reason for your existence is to is to follow the yellow brick road, which we'll get into and to transmute yourself through your own self-initiations as an autodidact that does things to change your life. It's not about your bullshit career. It's not about your, you know, dog shit resume. Like, fine. You know, it's like, again, it's it's nice to have gone to university and to have done the, you know, the loop to loop. I'm not saying people shouldn't be traditionally schooled, but just realize that's just like early stage, right? That's just, that's just the machine keeping us in low resonance so that we can just become robots our whole life. We probably have to do those things where we need to support ourselves. It's not like you want to be relying on other people. But as we follow this excellent path of what your heart tells you and like, oh, I, I want to I want to be like, let's say you for you, dude. It's like you want to make this podcast your full time gig and can support you so that you don't have to do your day job. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a long phase. But, you know, as you continue on this process, this is where you get surprising synchronicity and support along the way. So this is your spiritual journey is this right here. It's very practical and it's your day to day reality of what's going on about how you can adjust things for yourself. So it's it's like, be willing to be more simple and humble. And maybe you live in a tiny house and you know that you're going to make less money, X, Y, Z, but you're still going to be happier, right? You don't, you're not going to be in mm. the illusions the culture tells you makes you happy in terms of materialism and excess and all your toys. Yeah, you know, I've, just in my career, you know, I've met millionaires, I've met billionaires, I've worked for a couple of them, and they're dickheads, they're miserable people. And you can tell it when you get into a conversation with them. They're just <laughs> extremely narcissistic and unfulfilled. I mean, they, they literally can can have the life that they want. And on some level, they don't. You know, like they have failing marriages. They have kids that hate them because they're never home. They're not a good father. They're not a good mother. Whatever the case may be. Well, that's a good point, dude, is that you don't need to... Of course, we all need to be able to support ourselves. So I'm not saying that we all just go you know, jettison our jobs and live under the willow tree. I know a gal that is spiritually phenomenally excellent. She's very, very excellent. And she's had the same job for 20 years, right? And she's made the job work for her where it's not so much about, I'm not so much like anti-corporate in all stances, even though I think there's a massive separation between small businesses and massive mega corporations that just rape the earth for their profits. But the main thing that's, a, that's just a weird dynamic in our society is, and this is even worse in other countries, like in parts of Asia, like you look at Japan, where it's just the balance of how stupidly much we work and things that we don't want to be doing. It's like we have this insane you know, work ethic where this Protestant work ethic where it's like pull yourself up your, by your bootstraps, do all this work, work, work. And it's not like we don't want to work. You know, It's like we may even want to do something that's OK. But then how do we balance it where we work less, we work a few days a week, we work two days a week, where we then get another job that's more of our job that resonates with us? How could you make it so that you could, you know, have two days working in your day job and then the rest of this podcast filled the rest, rest of your week up, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the dynamic. And it's more about not letting the outside sources penetrate you where you then are so sucked into the con of what the culture gives you in terms of your success, right? So when you look at really rich people, the problem with really, really excessively rich people, usually most of them that are unconscious, every once in a while when you meet a really conscious, excellent rich person, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And maybe they're doing great stuff with their money is the problem with them is they're so time poor, right? Because time is the real measure of wealth. And so as I, I used to be somebody that made a lot of money. Now I don't make as much money personally, but I am very time rich. So your real your real richness is your time because you're spiritually the machine wants to suck away all your time and spiritually we need a lot of time to really grow. So it takes a long time to go into one of those libraries and decipher an old you know grimoire 
or something like that. Or, you know, yeah. if I'm going to do my third read on like Brills Above's Tales to his grandson or some shit, you know, that's going to take a long time. And that's the design of why a lot of those books are like that is they, they you need to do the work. And that's a lot of work. It's real work. So you need to have this. You need to structure your life so that you have the resources to do that. And it may mean that you just have a place where you, you know, you don't have so many. You live more simply and humbly. You live like the Zen samurai. Right. So that's right. the real deal. And that's why I think rich people are oftentimes quite miserable is because they may be running a Fortune 500 company making millions of dollars a year, but they're time poor. Yeah, I guess I never really thought about it that way, even though I completely agree with you. And I've talked, I've had this conversation with people in my own life is that like, you know, time is in my life, the most valuable currency. It's, it's the thing that I have to try to get more of, you know, like I think if you just look at language and you talk about how you describe time, you always are spending time. And that that equates to, uh, you know, what we would think of as like a financial transaction, you know, like, how do you spend your time? What do you pay attention to? You know, like those those sorts of words. And it's very simple when you break it down. But we don't really think of it that way. You know, like this is currency that we're giving away to people for really just some sort of fake money, like you alluded to earlier. But I am curious, you know, how did you really kickstart, you know, and this is going back to what I asked about, you know, like maybe some more practical advice for people that are struggling here. Like, how did you really kickstart the observation phase of this? Like, was it something like changing your diet? Was it exercise? I mean, like, what were some of the practical things that you could point to for people that are interested in getting more fulfillment spiritually and not not wanting to work as much for other people, but, you know, wanting to, to create more for themselves. Yeah, I think changing your diet and doing these things where you actually then start adjusting things in your life, like you're doing, you know, you're thinking, you're doing your actions or think you're, you're, fe- you're thinking, you're feeling in your actions, I should say. That's more kind of reformation. So I would say a lot of people that are probably listening to this podcast, dude, are, are, are you know, further along than they think. They're definitely not in the initial, I'm just in the blue pill of the matrix reality, right? Where I think that everything that CNN hands me is valid and accurate information. So for me personally, it was just, it's like layers of, it's layers and layers of an onion, right? So I think inherently maybe as we talk about the vast majority of people that are, that are dim and maybe bots in the simulation, the people that we can't talk to about any of this, maybe that if you look at things from kind of a, an Eastern perspective of many thousands of lies, maybe, maybe in 800 lies from now, they'll get there. They'll start this process. But I think as people are more kind of conscious and spiritually in- interested in excellence and truth and finding wisdom through other brethren, then they are in this process, right? They're starting this process. And as the times are changing, you know, we could argue going from like Pisces to Aquarius, things are shifting. I don't think it's designed for everybody to do it all the time. I think it's designed for a smaller amount of, of excellent people to go through this process. And that's what that's what this whole thing is about. That's what life is really about. It's about going through this process to change. And that's why the machine always prevents this process. It's trying to delay. It's trying to it's trying to crush the spiritual growth of every person. And so when you are doing some sort of occult or esoteric practice, let's say you're really interested in looking into Egyptology or you have you've, you've really gotten interested in astrology or you, you, you see some of the good things in the Bible from the more esoteric angles of them or, or, or you're, you, you, you happen to see some sort of alchemical manuscript and you're like, wow, what's this? I don't know what it is, but it's really interesting. You know, that's your that's your real observation. That's not the fake observation that the culture is handed to you. The real observation is your autodidact, your self self observing. So that's that's the beautiful thing. It's like, again, it's designed for every node on the network to do it one person at a time. So you have to do it yourself as the autodidact. And that's what this that's from a system standpoint. I'm coming to think that that's what this whole thing is about, is about everybody realizing it is like we're in this giant maze of of illusion and deceit. You know, most of those things that we worry about or we stress out about aren't really ever going to happen at all. And they're falsely handed to us. So when you seek out information, that's this like yummy vegetable hidden information, it's really, it's really excellent, right? So then mm-hmm. when you seek it out, you find it, and then you actually start changing things, you start reforming things in your life. That's what it's all about. And that's what I've realized just by my own personal process is very valid because it just makes you a much more happy person. You know, if I was, if I let other things influence me as to what I was perceived to be told is my happiness, especially in terms of resume and and day job. You know, I'd be miserable. I'd be much more miserable than what I have as an autodidact figured out on my own or else have a line to, again, like I said, through some of my projects that just happen to be with excellent people that have been valuable teachers that have shown me the way as, you know, we all walk our own paths. 
Yeah, and just from my own personal experience, like whenever I pick up an alchemical manuscript or, you know, like even just something like a biography of a famous alchemist or something, or I put on a tool record, you know, like you mentioned earlier, I always feel like consuming these things makes me feel so much more powerful. You know what I mean? Like it it does give you this sense of curiosity and wonderment, but also that, that sense of, you know, I can create these same things. I can do this same kind of work if I really developed yourself. I need some personal advice, though, from you, because I have a lot of people in my life who are more impressed by the latest Taylor Swift song than they are the latest Tool album, for example, which, you know, there is no late Tool album, but soon here, probably. Yeah, but, counting, counting the minutes till the latest Tool album. <laughs> <least> sure, <laughs> sure, yeah, which, by the way, we will have an episode where we break down all the esoteric symbolism in it whenever it comes out, for sure. But I am curious, you know, like, I get into conversations with people in my life about things like art, you know, music, film... Uh, novels and and i i get so disenchanted by the people who tell me that they are impressed by Nicki minaj songs or you know whoever the fuck and it feels like they don't like that i don't accept that that's what they like that that that's part of them and their their interests you know like that's part of their persona even on some level and it takes all of like what i have in me to not just scream at them and say this is not you like that's that's what the system or the machine you know wants you to like it's it's what they want you to enjoy but it's really not you so give me some advice how do i have that conversation in a nice polite way because i find myself not being nice and polite about it yeah i think it's a, it's a good question dude and i'm not as I, I've been using this term lately, student of life, where I try not to claim that I'm this like wise spiritual philosopher, but I'm just a student of all these things, right? As I constantly am learning and trying to stay humble. And as an autodidact, you can really only teach yourself or you can be in great conversations like this one where we teach each other. You know, there's a transmission of knowledge that you get information and I get information. And this is how it's supposed to happen, right? So when you hear people that are just of so low resonance and again, are so dim, I think the first thing is just to be nice to people, right? Everybody's at their everybody's at their stage of something. And if we know that let's let's say you and I are at stage three or four of ten or and the most people we talk to is are at one of ten. And we all have as the species moves into states of higher consciousness, you know, we will get back to places that we once were at, like in you know, we we hear stories or we hear myth of of places from long time past, like let's say Atlantis or ancient Egypt, where the whole species had been in higher stages of consciousness. But now obviously we're coming out of a very low resonant stage, which are with our famines and wars and environmental destruction and just these, you know, absolutely deplorable excuses for human beings and positions of power. Like all that shit is so low resonance that the best thing to do is just turn it off. And when you spend time with people that eat that shit up, just eat up the, the, the Kool-Aid poo. I think the best thing is to, to spend less time with them, be nice to them, appreciate that, be nice to everybody, be respectful, but then also just give less time, give less energy to that, right? So maybe you have to spend time with somebody that you don't really want to spend time with. Give yourself two, two hours a year. <laughs> I can do about three hours a year with certain people. And, and there's people in my life too that I do have to spend a lot of time with that know absolutely nothing about me because they ask me none of this. And they don't, the conversation never gets beyond the standard operating, right? So like you and I, dude, probably know more about each other than good buddies that we grew up with. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's all about narrowing the spectrum of how much rubbish you input. Again, turn off the external output as you observe what is real versus what is not real. And then your reformation is you then spending more of your time inputting excellence, which you've been doing at creating this podcast. You've, You've chosen to speak to excellent people of lucid, conscious wisdom rather than some mainstream reality tunnel standard operating dimness right so so yes we know that there's inherent good information there's there's yummy wisdom in this stuff and this is the stuff that really leads us to places of excellence because like i said as as a creator you as a writer or you know us as both writers you know it's all about creating essentially allegorical stories that transmit spiritual truths that then these kind of profound stories can then be it's all about creating essentially a classic allegory, which in, let's say, the vein of like, something like Homer's Odyssey or something entertains the masses, while also contains mystical messages that can be understood by the awakened, right? So that's how you do this, is if you, is if you then can create projects that speak to those larger amounts of people, even the people that don't know about the material, just like the Harry Potter references, that's really great if you can do that. And so spending that time to do that by spending more time creating and less time consuming... And especially 
time spending with people that don't do any of this either is totally the real kind of key to that. So that's that's the that's the journey. And that's what I've always found so valuable practically as I do this more and more. As somebody that's just a student, you know, early on, early on, I don't mm. ever claim to be Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> 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 yeah so hey let's talk more about that that creating and let's talk more about art because that that is really you know a big part of the podcast here or at least recently you know it's sort of been how i've positioned the show the you know like themes of it but i'm curious yeah. you know as somebody who does create were you creating for yourself before you entered your own, you know, kind of four personal stages of alchemy here? You know, like, were you doing things for yourself artistically while you were still working, you know, in the Hollywood lifestyle? And can you see the difference between them now that you're more aware of yourself? Yeah, from a perspective of former career, it was interesting because I kind of synchronistically had worked on some th films that Again, at the time, I didn't know the underlying themes of them, but I had just happened to work on several projects that had really interesting in-depth themes in them. They weren't my personal projects, but, but, you know, as I worked on something like the Matrix sequels or, or something like, you know, that had very had, had themes in it that I wasn't aware of, I had just happened to work on these projects that were like that unconsciously. And then it did take me a good, let's say, decade plus to then start making my own projects, much of which were not as developed because I hadn't figured out who I was as myself yet, right? So I had, you know, like an artist looks back at their earlier work and they're like, oh, this work isn't very good because they didn't know who they were, right? So it's like you, as within, so without. So you have to reform self internally before you can create good shit. That's like, we'll say that 25 times during this conversation. So it took me a long time to do that. And yes, I was doing it earlier, but I wasn't making as good of stuff, right? So I mean, you had said, too, that you had had a, a previous podcast that you had done or you have previous writings that you've made. And you look back at some of them and some of them are really good. But some of them you're like, oh, I can't believe I, I wrote this. This was such rubbish because <laughs> you hadn't figured out as much you wanted to talk about and what themes you wanted to to create. Right. So as me as this kind of like obscure esoteric filmmaker, you know, I'm just now starting to create projects like the ones I mentioned that are doing these things that are a reflection of, of myself. So that's that's totally the dynamic. You know, to that same point, yeah, I, I did do the podcast previously. It actually wasn't too bad, but that in and of itself was a reflection of where I was at the time. Like, it started off very sort of just generic, and then I noticed, yeah. like, the, the past, like, handful of, or sorry, the last, like, you know, five to seven episodes that I did for it was they were increasingly personal and spiritual and things like that. So that's a whole other conversation. But in terms of the writing, I don't get to do much writing for myself because this podcast has consumed much more of my time. But to your point, though, I've started to write stories, novels, and gotten to a certain point in the story and just had to stop because I knew that I was at a point where I didn't know myself well enough to be able to continue to tell it you know like this story required a yep. different version of me that wasn't here was not present that needed to be cultivated still on some level and i, yes. I just have to yes. take a step back so it's disappointing because god damn like i want to write like that's really what I've, I've always had an interest in it but i haven't been able to for a long time because and you were the first person here like we had a private conversation like a month prior to us recording here today or so and you had articulated that developing self before developing art idea to me and that's the first time I really heard that and it spoke to me and it resonated with me and it it reinforced that idea that I just fleshed out that I wasn't ready to tell my own story yet in writing you know like I can talk about it here but to be able to sit down and like write a novel and and create characters and stories and, and worlds i just i was not ready to do that because i didn't know who the fuck i was so i was Absolutely. very fortunate yeah so i was very fortunate to just come across you and have that conversation off air and then you know here we are sharing a bit of it on air now and i said to thank you man like you really did articulate something to me that i was struggling with for a long time i was frustrated with myself as an artist and as a creator like why am i not able to do this and i, I had always got to a point where i just felt i had hit like a mental roadblock like not necessarily writer's block but just that there was something holding me back. And lo and behold, of course, it's true for all of us. It was fucking me. Like it was me holding myself back on some level or my lack of development in some level or on some level that was holding me back. I still think in terms of 
of writing, I'm not quite there yet. You know, the podcast has helped me creatively sort of come out of my shell and get to know myself better, having conversations with guys like you, you know, but in order to go back into that, that mode, which is, you know, writing is a very isolated thing to do. And it is in and of itself a reflection yeah. of, you know, that the, the, the spiritual growth process, I think. So yeah, I'm not there yet. But I'm glad that I was, you know, like I said, I'm, I feel like I'm a broken record here, but I, I am glad that I came across you and your articulation of this to me because I don't, I don't think I would understand it completely or at least to the level that I understand it now if I hadn't have heard you tell me those things. So thank you. Yeah, dude, I'm absolutely a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And you know, I get I get so much knowledge from people I talk to too. And it's not like I'm always just trying to be a teacher or I feel like again, maybe me saying student of life is really saying I'm a teacher of life, but I think as long as you acknowledge that you're always learning and what's so great is when you can get around excellent other wise elders that know more than you. And that's why if you if you move to a town and you're just like there's fuck all nothing here and I can't there's nobody to talk to and it's why it's great that we do have the internet so that we can have these conversations over you know remotely. What's really great is if you can get in the presence of other people like let's say there's a Masonic lodge in your town or something and you meet somebody that's a, actually knows something at the lodge or that type of dynamic is really how information is transmitted through time. And when you hear about like wisdom, and especially like the secret sauce mystery school wisdom is transmitted from person to person. And it, it, much of it isn't even written down in books and you have to feel the information. So when you hear somebody's stuff and it's like this, just, yes, you just, yes, it just is. It's it just rings true with me. That's the shit. So I, I agree, dude. And I think that I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and that's something that as I have been, not like this system I've talked about is my system. It's just been tr communicated to me through other people that know even more than I do that are spiritually phenomenal, wise, elder folks. That's that's a beautiful thing. You know, that's this is the creative self, right? It's like you are more proud probably of things that you've done through this podcast than other things. I'm more proud of the projects I've created for no money independently than these mega Oscar winning movies I worked on as a cog in the machine. Mm -hmm. So this is this is how you get to true creativity and, and not just copy is by connection with self, figuring out who you are, which you have to go off and do. And it takes, again, these are decade long processes. So the more that you do this podcast and the more you talk to excellent other people, the more you learn who you are and what you're interested in, what, what resonates with you. And then the more you get inspiration to sit down and write something. And so, yes, it's a very nonlinear process too, I, I feel, dude. And as I do more of these kind of essays, which are nice because it's me just creating my own me, me writing my own little piece and then just basically saying it into camera as everything is a reflection. It's all mirror work. So everything's like a mirror of me talking to myself. It's, it's me just helping myself through the process learn. And so you can track where you've been through your journey, right? And so right. this is the true creative process. It's like how you really tr find your true creative voice. And as everybody's a unique snowflake, how you write seminal, excellent, creative things, this is how you do it. And this is how maybe you could argue somebody like Philip K. Dick did it, where he got his weird, like, pink laser download. You know, it's like he, he had some blast from either his subconscious or what you could say his higher self was, and, and that, that is where the information comes from. So I think as you get even further developed in selfhood, exoterically, your outer self, what you're actually changing, where you're living, what job you have, as you're internally transmuting yourself, you are then creating things that are more originally your own voice, and then you're also getting transmissions from that divine place, right? From source or from your, your higher being. So this is where you can argue people channel information from or get, you know, kind of, it just came to me. I was in the shower one morning and I got this piece of inspiration. And so that's what we can basically really identify with as we kind of lead into our next conversation as well about somebody that had created essentially the, you know, quintessential American fairy tale. Right. So as we kind of phase out of our own stories and into somebody else's stories, maybe in, in this next conversation, you know, we can talk about something like The Wizard of Oz, which is a, a amazing success of spiritual interest, which was essentially written in the 1890s, where, you know, most Americans were essentially conservative Christians. But this gentleman named Lyman Frank Baum had written a story which anticipated the population's kind of progressive abandonment of traditional religion, religious orthodoxy in some ways and embrace more of what was true, authentic spirituality. You know, we look at somebody like like him who then had also done this or like Philip K. Dick, who had also done this, who had then developed themselves internally to, to then create something of excellence out externally. That's that's the that's the real juju. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it definitely is, and yeah, I can't wait to get to that. Let's not get to it just yet because I I did want to respond to something that you said. 
I have realized that as I'm talking to people, both, you know, I guess on here and in my own life, I realize that like, especially when I get into advice giving mode, you know, like more in my personal life, or if you look at the things I say, like after a conversation to sort of wrap it up, I've realized that while I am consciously talking to listeners, I'm actually just most of the time, I'm just talking to myself. Like I'm reminding myself of what I have to do to be a better person, to grow and mature. And that's the inspiration for the podcast is to just remind myself of what is important and and what what I have to do. And then the flip side of that, though, was I don't know if I talked about this either, but I started this podcast to be able to communicate with people in my own life, in my own day to day life in a different way, because this is me and they don't know me. They don't know like this version of me, if that makes any sense. And yeah. I wanted to give an outlet to people who want it, you know, whether it's friends or family that wanted to know, like, you know, who is Ryan? Like, is he this this character that you've sort of projected certain traits onto in, in your own mind and then that's who you interact with all the time? Or is he like his own individual person who's developed his own individual self and wants to share that with you? but you aren't in a position where you're even ready to accept your own self. So how the fuck could you accept somebody else? I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's essentially like, that's, that's why I'm here. And I'm sure on some level, that's why you're here too. Like, I think you, you touched on that a while ago, you know, like we're having these conversations and you and I probably know more about each other through an hour of conversation like this than we would if we'd been best friends, just going to the movies for 30 years together. Yeah, There's just something about, sitting down and talking to someone not about politics or pop culture or bullshit like that just external sources yeah yeah, just talking to them about them and who they are and what their goals are even like like even if that does come back to to things like career you know like what are these people really looking for like what do they want out of their own life and their own time and their own existence here and those are the conversations that while they're happening more often in mediums like this you know on the internet over skype you know, whatever, like we need to take these to living rooms and we need to take them to to back porches. And I don't know how to do that. Like I haven't figured that out in my own life. Like how do I translate the types of conversations I want to have here to my day to day life with people who I think could benefit from that, you know, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but that's that's where I'm at right now. I do. I do. And, you know, we're, we're very social beings. And as you raise up your stair steps through the dojo of the mind, you know, Morpheus training Neo in the dojo of the mind, and you get higher up in belts, you know, you need other people that are at equivalent belts to you or higher. So if you're living somewhere where most of us are, the vast majority of people listening to this don't have people they can talk to in their immediate surroundings. And we are desperate for real conversations, right? So we create something like a podcast so that we can have these real conversations remotely with other people. And to, to kind of go back and answer a previous question you asked me, dude, which ties into this, is that we are one of the catalysts for me, really, I guess you could say, actually then going through this process was I would constantly look around at the world and I'd be like, why do most people not want to talk about any of the stuff that I want to talk about? It's like they're talking about this absolute sliver of a sliver of a sliver of what is the true nature of reality. And, you know, we look at the we look at just absolute when I whenever I go back and I happen to have the grave, grave misfortune of looking at something that's within, you know, a TV is on at a at an airport or something. You're looking at like the latest, just absolute dreadful, dim, low resonant poo of some mainstream news cycle. You're just like, oh, my God, I can't believe that people actually find this to be anything to do with the tiny nature of, of, of what is reality, right? It's like a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of the, that is possible to what can be talked about. And they're just talking about this, you know, absolute tawdry garbage. And it's just all over every news channel. And it's like repeated at nauseum. So when, when we kind of become more conscious human beings, and you kind of look around also at the world, and you're like, why do most people do things that they don't want to be doing? Right? And so it's all interconnected, right? And so day to day, we, we, as we do things to better ourselves, as we observe what is the true nature of what's going on, which sadly most people don't, but po- folks that would be listening to this conversation or you and I are doing those things a bit and then starting to maybe reform some things in our life to then figure out who we really are. That is so empowering. And you should feel really, really good after having a conversation with somebody that's excellent. You know, you should just seek out these yummy campfire conversations where 
after you have them, you're just like, yes, I feel like my batteries have been recharged, right? Because that's the good stuff. And that's where you're getting, you can be who you really are in the conversation. You don't have to put on some fake mask because somebody doesn't know who all of what Ryan Preverly is. And you can also be getting information that is bettering you and helping you to figure out who you are as you move towards real selfhood, right? And as I move towards real selfhood, figuring out like, what the hell are we doing? And what is this life all about? And who are we really meant to be? What is our path here? Because anybody that's walking a spiritual path as Dorothy is in The Wizard of Oz, which we'll talk about, there is profound importance as to why you're here. You know, and it's not all beige and gray and boring. It's like you are very excellent and you are very important. And there's reasons why you should be following this road. So that's why you should structure your life so that you can do those things and give yourself the time to do them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like I had an astrologer tell me not too long ago that I was essentially, I don't want to say doomed, but it sounds like, it sounds like doomed to me, but that I was essentially doomed to a life of working mediocre jobs because I was meant to like go into these places and sort of help I don't know grow or transform some aspect of the people's lives in there I mean he, he told me this based on my natal chart so it's something that I've mm. I've noticed in my own life like yeah I've just sort of had you know weird low paying to decent paying jobs and I've always ran up against people that are I don't know how to say this but like they they need some sort of of pick me up, you know, like they need some sort of assistance to get to that next level in their life. And I feel like I've been able to to help them do that on some level. Even before I was doing this podcast, even before I knew what the occult was, yeah. I had noticed based on what he told me that I had always been doing that, that that was just sort of the role that I had played in, in people's lives. And to then also accept that like, there are going to be people that come in and I do that with that I may want to stay, but they're going to ultimately have to leave because, you know, they're not part of, of my own growth on some level. Yeah. How do we quiet down this external world, you know, and just be able to, to find time for ourselves here? There's so much noise out there. It's a great sort of macro metaphor in the backdrop of this conversation because I don't know if people have, have heard the noise on my end, but I have people working on my house. I have my cat coming in and just yelling at me because I don't know why. And it's just like, this is no, it's just all, a perfect example of it. Go ahead. It, it's all good. It is a perfect example because when you live in a place that's like a, let's say you're living in some very busy urban environment, you're living in downtown Manhattan, right? It's not the best place to work on your spiritual development. I can see why you know, Zen monks go and live in a quiet monastery and just move sand around half the day, right? And they just meditate. I mean, I think that you can get lost in both of those. And it's more about friendships and doing things in the world. So I wouldn't want to just do either of those things, but there's a balance to all of them. But to, to go back to just two things that you said, everything is a ripple in the pond, right? So when you see things that you've tracked back through your own life that you have always been doing, notice those things and then follow the trail from there, right? So you have always been doing X, Y, and Z I have felt the same way in my life where you've you've subconsciously been doing things and you don't know why. And then as you as you develop more, you realize why those things have been happening and then continue along that path. You know, notice the signs and follow it because it's it's it it leads to again, you have you as an individual snowflake, and we're all individual snowflakes, your path is custom designed for you in this maze, right? So you, you obstacles in your life are like so many of our spiritual lives are like, who the fuck we can talk to, how many actual excellent spiritual friendships we have that really know who we are. We all struggle with these things. And then how do we make stupid fake money and, you know, the and fiat money is just such a joke, dude. It's such a whole nother story, but it's just, it's an illusion to get you to waste your whole lifetime just, you know, slaving for paychecks. But at the same time, when we struggle financially and like we struggle to support ourselves or like, it's not like we're in the lowest stages of Maslow's hierarchy of needs or something, but that balance of like, how do we just live comfortably and live with the base of what we need while also doing things of excellence that's the timeless the timeless thing where even michelangelo suffered from as an artist where it's like he couldn't the beautiful original things that he wanted to paint he had to paint like what the church commissioned for him right stuff like that where you have to kind of balance your own work with like your work that pays you better so usually the work that pays better is the most kind of like you know wish-washy bland work and because everything is so corporatized in our structure, it's like the most if I wanted to go make the most money, I'd have to go, you know, make that money for some really vapid, horrible product that was just something I'd never want to buy myself. Mm -hmm. As you as you speak about how, you know, you and your day job, you have to sell people crap that they don't need to go make a paycheck. Of course, you know, these are the things that we figure out. But again, as we slowly phase out of these things, it takes a long time. And in terms of the astrologer telling you that you're doomed or destined for something, I would think that's total horseshit. Because as you said beautifully earlier, dude, everything, it's all mirror work. 
like as within, so without. So everything that you say to somebody else, you're really saying to yourself. So I would say more that the astrologer is saying that about himself than he is about you, right? So if you wish happiness and love and kindness and share true excellence with people that have ears to hear, then that is part of the journey. And that's what like in the Corpus Hermeticum, it says you are here to help your other spiritual brethren. And the more you help them, the more you help yourself, the more you give over other excellent knowledge to people that are ready to hear it and have the ears to hear it and are ready to receive it, the more that charges your battery. So the more you wish wish excellence upon others, the more you will get that in your own life and that will manifest in your life. And if you see people that are just, again, yelling at each other, or screaming at each other, or having you know, these breakdowns or just their lives a mess and they're just wishing, you know, ill will on others. It's because they wish that for themselves. Again, it's such a it's such a dynamic of input output that you have to balance those things internally so that then you can structure your th- those things for the opposite side of the coin. Both sides are the same thing. You know, what's really beautiful, dude, about this conversation is how personal you've been, too, because it, it's nothing it's not quite there's nothing quite like speaking from the heart, you know, and as men, a lot of men don't really get in touch with their heart that much, you know, and from a, if you look at like the chakra ladder from an Eastern perspective of, you know, going down from the base up to the third eye chakra and the crown mm-hmm. chakra, that's kind of the Eastern perspective. But what is another beautiful way to look at it is the, is a Western kind of mystery tradition perspective of you, you start with the mind and then you go down to the heart and then you get to the will. And each one is significantly more difficult. And the will is kind of like your base primal and your, your mind is of course, your what you think and your heart is what you feel. So as two guys, you know, sharing their heart, heart stories here. It's it's a really beautiful connection between authenticity and, and how you really, really want to connect with another person at a soul level. It's like, what do you really, how do you spill your heart to other people that are interested to hear it and you know can help? Just kind of share some guidance or some insight on it. Talk about the great work. I mean, that is that. It's the hardest work that you'll ever pursue, Absolutely. you know, like that's that's the career that you should really, you know, strive for is, is to get in touch with every aspect of yourself, you know, mind, body, spirit, heart, soul, whatever you want to label it, right? So I've always been an emotional person in the sense that like, I've always been open to the experiences and the sensations and talking about them and sharing them. And it's not something that is, is newfound territory for me personally to be able to speak this way. I've, I've always spoken this way. And if anybody's hearing this, that's known me for, you know, not just the last couple of years, but, you know, my entire life almost. Like, this is a more mature version of who I've always been, a, a more articulate version of who I've always been. And it's nice to be able to, like you said, have those chats where you take your own walls down, you take your own veils down, you know, because that that is what holds all of us back. You know, I mentioned that in terms of my own writing, like I was the one holding myself back from finishing that story. And when you look at what you want to accomplish in your life, whether it is material even or not, like it's always some aspect of yourself, you know, your own boundaries that you've created for yourself. You tell yourself you can't go there, you can't do that. And that is ultimately the thing that you have to overcome, right? So yes, (sighs) <sighs> well, run out of and, and to, no, to add to that, dude, that's a beautiful statement because I had one of the things that I was thinking I could share on this and, and the beautiful power of what you just said, and especially in terms of competition or creativity, right? It's like one of the other reasons I got out of Hollywood is it's the most like cutthroat egotistical place in the universe, right? Where everybody's trying to ladder climb. And I would encourage people whenever they see any sort of competition. And of course, the society, the society very much teaches competition with us, like in terms of adolescent sports and, you know, oh, healthy competition, healthy competition. And like ladder climbing is, of course, what we're, what we're told to seek for, you know, to climb, climb these ladders. But there's a, I pulled this beautiful quote from a gentleman named Wallace D. Waddles to talk about the power of the mind and not even, you know, giving a shit about any of that. And I'll just kind of read it here because it's very relevant to what you said. He says, there is a thinking stuff from which all things are made. And with original state permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imagined by this thought. The power of the mind. Man can from these things and he thought, he thinks, and by impressing his thoughts upon the formless substance can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. Right? So this is the power of manifestation through cleaning out your mind and realizing powerful you are without the competition from others. In order to do this, a man must pass from the competitive to the creative mind. Otherwise, he cannot be in harmony with the formless intelligence, which is always creative and never competitive in spirit, right? So when you clean out the garbage and just clean out the mind, that's when you connect with higher self. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can really just, it's like, don't worry. I I still sometimes struggle too, dude, with like looking at other people's shit online or looking at somebody else's portfolio and looking at all these accolades or like from a past career where it's all about the awards you win and stuff. And, you know, all, all that stuff's fucking stupid. But like, I still will list like, 
you know, my kind of wins and things like that to kind of be in balance with a little bit in balance with the resume, a little bit in balance with what's more spiritually truthful. But all that competitive stuff is just such rubbish. So it's like, that's something that people can get really bummed out about. It's like, oh, I look at somebody else's stuff and they, it looks like they've accomplished so much more than I have. But, you know, your journey is, is only your own story. So it's like, don't worry about all that other shit that, you know, is pushed on you or that you, you feel like is, is somebody, somebody, you look at somebody else and it's like, oh, look at how successful they are. Or look at how many followers they have. All that stuff is just absolute, again, back to poo. It's fecal Kool-Aid vomit. <laughs> so all that matters is what you from within, what you from within realize is true for you. And of course, be kind and respect and loving to others. It's not like you, you know, there's a difference between let thy will be done and let my will be done. It's not about your ego, but it's about you developing yourself and then also seeing that reflection from within and how that changes things in your life. That's how you get to happiness, right? It's not, not like happiness is, an end, is just a destination. You know, life's a journey. It's not a destination, but it's, it's not feeling like, oh, I need to, I need to do just, just be present in, in the moment and let things come when they come and then follow your own path for what's true for you and what resonates with you. And that's the following the heart and sharing those heart stories because you see that so many people go through the same struggles that we all go through. You know, so many people that are probably listening to this go through the same struggles that you and I have talked about or things that you've hinted on or like, yeah, I don't even know where I am yet. How do I know what to create? And if I create anything, how is it even going to pay the bills? You know, I have to do some stupid something else to make money and pay the rent, blah, blah, blah. That's the dynamic of just like, give yourself time, live light and find your, your, your true calling so that you can then, you know, continue along this process. Cause this is the process. This is the reason why we're here. Yeah, and Fecal Kool-Aid Vomit may end up being the title of this episode, although I wouldn't <laughs> want to confuse people and make it seem like it's some sort of fetish. <laughs> it sounds like a fetish website. <laughs> but, anyway. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. but yeah, I mean, no, that that is the best way to describe it, because it's shit, it's regurgitated shit, and then it's also drinking shit that is meant to just... <laughs> dumb you down or keep you at that base level of consciousness or the the base chakra however you want to look at it but yeah um, so human centipede of <laughs> awfulness constantly berating yes, into the television yes. <laughs> and that's the thing is i'm not it's not like all of it it's like 90 plus percent right so then it's not like you know i don't own a television or something i mean i, I occasionally will see something that is excellent it's like wow this show really rocked my world and so it's not like we there occasionally things will slip through that we spoke of earlier that is one thing yeah. I wanted to touch on before we transition topics here. And it goes back to what we started out talking about. Like you're talking about Hollywood and all the just the filth and the trash that comes out of it. But there are some gems, you know, that come yeah. out of there that, that really do articulate this more spiritual journey, you know, this more uh, transcendence of, of self journey. Like you mentioned, The Wizard of Oz, which we'll get into in the next part of our chat. But there are those things that sneak through that do, I guess, you know, articulate all or illuminate something about this journey that we're on, how do those get through? Like, are those intentionally created? <laughs> that's, the, that's, a, that's, a, that's the $64,000 question, because that's what in my life I'm trying to figure out right now, right? As I create things and we pitch projects and we, we, you know, we get to these high levels of the kind of current structure as the industry is changing so much, you know, we pitch something to Amazon or to like HBO or something. And it seems like at times we they're interested and at other times they're not. It's like, how does the good stuff actually get through? And that's something I'm very much figuring out. I think is typically, I'm not above the conspiracies of saying that most people that reach very high level fame have done some sort of, you know, dark sorcery in terms of selling out. So I'm not above that to say, but I am, I do feel that there is strange goings ons where good information is intentionally suppressed and bad information or so-so information is intentionally put to the forefront or at least put forward as, as the good stuff, right? So typically you will find information that might have half-truths in it that's pretty popular, but really, really excellent stuff is rare to find. And if you do find it, it's very off in the woods, right? Like I don't, like any of my material is not hugely popular, right? And you'll probably find that with a lot of occult book authors or something that have sold like 12 copies of a book. So mm -hmm. That that is the that's the question that I'm very much figuring out myself, dude. And it's like I think it's all about it's all about almost doing it so under the radar. You're you're an established person, but then you've maybe it has been unconsciously done, which as we kind of get into the next part of our conversation, I think we can talk about somebody that did this constantly or consciously, but then somehow just things unconsciously slipped through because of just it it was the right place at the right time. So systematically it was let through on a, on a higher level. 
Right. It was yeah. the information that the that everybody needed at that time, so it just got through. Definitely, man. So I guess before we go here, then, tell the listeners where they can find more of your work. I know you have multiple projects going on. Yeah, I can always be found at NilesHeckman.com, man. So that's just N-I-L-E-S-H-E-C-K-M-A-N.com. And that's, you know, kind of aggregates to my various projects. So, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure, Ryan. You know, I always want to compliment you on your show. It's just, I... I always try and be a listener of a show before I chat on it. And so I've been going through the archive and I've really dug it. And like I mentioned to you, as we chatted previously, keep doing the good work, man, because this is a great thing. And I think as you continue to do it, you'll continue to get more gems out of it and little like life changing moments. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. So I compliment you on what you're doing and keep it up, buddy, for sure. Thank you so much. That's really kind of you. And uh, I do appreciate that. Yeah, buddy. No problem. You know, much love to uh, you and everybody listening. And it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure always talking to you. With you. We'll we'll do it uh, numerous times again, I'm sure. And um, it'll it's we should always keep keep these conversations up. So I'm always delighted to hear from anybody that wants to talk to me directly. To, to you know, I find that I really do en- enjoy that one-on-one interaction with people that are seeking out things. So um, long may you shine. <laughs> yep, keep walking that yellow brick road, right? Yeah, absolutely. Pencil. And there you have it. My thanks again to Niles Heckman for stopping by and contributing such a great conversation, sort of a unique conversation, and as I said in the beginning, quite a personal conversation at that. If you missed the second hour, a lot of the themes we discussed in the first part were applied to the story of The Wizard of Oz. Niles actually lays out three occult and esoteric layers to the film. We talk about the Federal Reserve and the monetary system, L. Frank Baum's Theosophical Leanings, Alchemical Transmutation, and The Corporate Straw Man. You know, the all caps, legal name fiction, birth certificate, natural law stuff. We also talk about animism, the imagination, and the surprising connections between The Wizard of Oz and What About Bob? You know, that old Bill Murray, Richard Dreyfuss movie. And then that movie's connection to Theosophy and the number 44. Pretty interesting stuff. And also a scene from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead that also ties in here. Pretty cool stuff. So if you're into all that, again, you can hear that second hour at patreon.com slash oldculture for just two bucks a month. And there will be more content like that on the way. And a quick shout out to Niles again, because he actually started supporting the show on Patreon just last week. Some synchronistic timing there. And also a thank you to Vanessa from the new Butterflies and Incantations podcast for supporting the show recently. Vanessa is a fellow Ohioan and just launched her podcast. And the first guest was Miguel Connor who was just here with us, so check that out if you want some more of Miguel's Gnostic stylings dancing around your ear holes. Also, please feel free to rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you are listening. I want to give a quick shout out to James and Jordan for recent reviews of the show on iTunes. Much appreciated, guys. And my thanks to all of you who've been downloading the show. The audience grows every week, and it continues to amaze me that even one person enjoys this, let alone thousands of you. Please know that I am grateful for your time and support. And speaking of time, I'm out of it for right now, but there will be another time, and until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, question authority, and follow your yellow brick road. Oh, 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 oh,